So two, nearly three years ago, I mentioned this game in my Rayman Raving Rabbids review, and upon doing that I immediately rushed out and bought a copy, but never got around to actually playing it. That was until this Christmas when I finally got around to giving it a whirl. This is probably one of the weirdest things that I own, and unlike Johnny Rock, it's not really something that sticks out on your shelf. In fact, it's quite the opposite, it blends in because it looks so damn generic. I have to admit though, if you look it up, there are some weird things that jump out at you. Like, why hasn't anyone mentioned this since it came out? Why was it given all those press conferences at E3 and then Ubisoft have never bought it up again? Like, they just left the website up and never even touched it since. Why can't I find a walkthrough on this thing on the entire internet? Yeah. No matter how obscure a game has been thus far, I've always been able to find some form of walkthrough for it, but... Apparently not this game. I mean, if Desperate Housewives can have a walkthrough, then it baffles me how anything can go without a walkthrough on this entire planet, and yet somehow this does. Basically, this game is Ubisoft's answer to the Mario Striker football game, which is presented to us in a fashion vaguely similar to that Harry Potter Quidditch game. Yeah, it's a bit weird. I decided to go looking for it and found an E3 conference, most of which was a Ubisoft presenter who didn't understand what football was or why it was so popular, and Pele, who was trying to stall for time whilst the idiot intern at the back started the damn MP4 file. It's apparent that Pele had little involvement with the project, as the information he could tell you could be found on the back of the box. He's the mentor of a footballing school that believes in team spirit in the game, and it's his favourite part about it. It's basically the gist of what he's saying here, which is the majority of the presentation, as he has to say the whole thing in his own language before it's translated for the audience. I feel really bad for this translator as well because this guy gets really creepy with her. What is she? Does she speak? I think it's somebody to help us. She's okay. more attractive than both of us combined, thank god. Pele was a bit more involved with this game, at least a lot more than I originally thought he'd be. They actually kept putting him on the spot and making him do these interviews in English. And he barely speaks English. This makes these segments awkward as fuck to watch because He's having to answer questions presented to him in a language that he barely speaks. And in one of them, he doesn't have his translator with him. And it's obvious that he doesn't fully understand the questions in a lot of instances. I mean, he does his best and he's charming and funny in spite of this, but I just feel really bad for the poor guy. It's difficult to say who was the best player. Mm -hmm. you know, because we have a now, we have a mess, we have Kaká, the new generation. But uh, my mummy, <laughs> she told me I am the best in the world. <laughs> That's my mind said. Then I agree. <laughs> In fact, I actually would say he does a pretty good job. I think he's better than he thinks he is at speaking English. And uh, he is more lacking in confidence and lacking in ability. But it's still clear that he has to put thought into every single phrase that he does, so... I don't think it's fair to just leave him hanging like that. Surprise, surprise, Ubisoft lied about this trailer, as it depicts characters talking in the opening when they actually default to the usual gibberish that we got from a lot of games around that time, like Rayman Raving Rabbids and Far Cry 2. Just mouth noises, really. Yet in this game, they pretend that the characters speak and that they have these ADR things in there that clearly aren't in the game. The effort that they put into this lie just brings a smirk to my face. It is the same way in the opening to the game, but even that's just unrepresentative. Like, if they seriously think it should be this way, then why don't they make it that way? It makes little sense to me. It's not hard to put voice dialogue in games, people have been doing it for 30 years. The game revolves around two schools of football who compete for supremacy whilst training the children who are recruited by them. Very early in, you can tell that this game takes inspiration from Harry Potter, in the same way that Leatherface takes inspiration from his victims. The game starts off by showing us this kid, who I named Dirk. You know, affectionately. And he gets his ticket to Hogwarts. I mean Brightfield. I mean Peleland. 
He travels across the world in a steam train and his suitcase explodes, potentially symbolising him jizzing his pants. I do have to admit that I like the animation in these cutscenes. The flat backgrounds and simplistic art style, combined with the slightly stop motion janky movement effects given to the game, it gives it a real personality of its own. So, did you enjoy that brief moment where the plot made sense? Yes? Good, because it's not going to make any more sense from here on out. Dirk hands this letter, after rudely pushing to the front like an asshole, and Pele quickly notices that his signature is a forgery. He even stops to think on it like he's immediately figured out what happened. That his rival, from the other school, forged his name to get Dirk to show up. Now, maybe I'm a bit too cautious, but wouldn't you just be a little concerned at the fact that your name has been forged? Wouldn't you launch an investigation, internally and externally? If you know who has done it, as it is implied here, then why shouldn't Pele call the police and get this asshole with the unibrow arrested? There's literally no reason why Pele shouldn't be using any of these tools at his disposal. But, you see, uh, this is where we learn the most important thing about Pele. He's an idiot. Despite him being the Dumbledore of this Harry Potter football world, he is the biggest idiot walking with the possible exception of the main antagonist. So then Dirk does a thing with his feet, and Pele also jizzes his pants, and ends up saying, eh, fuck it, who needs an invitation at the invite-only school for witches and wizards? I'm Pele, I can do whatever the fuck I want. So it's implied that he just accepts this forgery as legal tender and allows Dirk into the academy. He doesn't even stop to read the forged contract in case there are any surprises. And oddly enough, there are a few. I know that's really shocking that, you know, a contract that somebody forged has been altered in some way. But it's apparently a huge shock in this universe. And it ends up being such a pain in the ass for all the characters later in the plot. All Pele had to do was print off another copy of the regular contract and literally none of the bad things that happen in this game would happen. Well, because Pele is an idiot, as we've established, he allows a forged contract to be made legal by acknowledging it and putting it in the safe with the rest of them. Even if you want to ignore the possibility of Dirk being a plant or a spy, wouldn't it be prudent of Pele to sign him on on his own terms? Nah, fuck it. Contracts don't mean anything anyway, except when they do. I'm Pele. Pele. So the first act of the story is building up your team, and you win some low-level contest. Then you win another contest in the second act that's slightly more important. It's at this point that the contract bollocks comes back to bite you in the ass. You see, in order for... Oh, yeah, um... Spoilers, uh, if you care about that, I'll uh, put a timestamp on, uh, should you want to skip. You know, if you give a shit about this 10 year old game that's a Wii exclusive. But after winning your second tournament, the unibrow Slytherin guy marches up to you and reveals what was in that forgery of a contract. Now, one important detail here is that Dirk's contract is stolen about halfway through Act 2. Pele's office is burgled, his vault cracked open, and they steal Dirk's contract. I really don't get why the Slytherin guy does this. Really, the only thing it could do is hurt the claim that he has on the contract. You see him here holding the contract, which is stolen property, and has been acquired through illegal means. This is the point where you should be calling the police, Pele. I also don't get it either, because at the end of Act 1, they show him holding the contract. I don't get, like, did he have the contract and then put it back? Was this a mistake? Was he supposed to have it? Is that a copy? What? Whatever. So, even if you would say that this isn't evidence that he has anything to do with the theft, you can still say that he's in possession of stolen property, and it's not like he can play dumb and pretend that he didn't know that it belonged to Pele. However, Pele is so stupid that it never occurs to him to just say anything other than, oh yeah, um, yeah, this contract is legit. I'm sorry, kid. Fuck you. I mean, even if you aren't smart enough to call the police, 
in the event that property was stolen from your office and is shoved into your face a few days later, couldn't you at least make the fair point that the contract is now void and untrustworthy? I mean, it has been in this guy's possession for days after being stolen and could have been tampered with in a number of ways. And you can't even prove that it hasn't been tampered with, that nothing was added or taken away during that time that it was out of your hands. That's what I would do, fuck it. This is why I said before about stealing the contract being a dumb idea, because the contract doesn't even need to be in the villain's possession for this plan to work. All he has to do is appear and say, yes, but Dirk's contract allows this bullshit transfer, and Pele would have had to abide by it. Should he question it, they can go back to Pele's vault and see it for themselves. Sure, this would expose him as the guy who forged the original contract, but this guy is fine with exposing himself as an orchestrator of theft, or at least someone who's illegally benefiting from theft. So, I highly doubt that matters to him. Incrimination doesn't seem to be a problem because the police don't seemingly exist in this universe, and no tampering of contracts is illegal anyway, so fuck it. Also, how the fuck did Pele not see this? Can you not read, Pele? Well, maybe if it's in English, in this world he couldn't read it, but in this universe, Pele can clearly speak English fluently, and all of his contracts are in English. So, that's not an excuse here. All you had to do was make Dirk sign a fresh contract and bin the old one, and none of this could have or would have happened. Why you so stupid, Pele? Why you idiot? So this is where the third turn begins, and it's hell. Plot-wise, it's the stalest part, as fuck all happens. But gameplay-wise, it's awful. I'll talk more about that in a bit, though. So Dirk is now a member of Scythemore, who are the Slytherin house of Pele's school of witchcraft and wizardry, and you finally get to see why this unibrow bastard had you recruited to begin with. I figured it would be fun to list all of the possible logical reasons I can think of, and then throw an illogical one in there, and see if you could come up with which one is the right one. Is it A, he wants to plant a player to become Pele's prodigy so he can snatch him up and use Pele's talents against him? B, throw a spanner in the works of Pele's team by t you know what, fuck this, fuck it, I'll, j I'll just tell you what it is, it's none of them, by the way, none of them. No, his plan is actually too brilliant for our comprehension. See, his plan is to plant Dirk into Pele's academy, let Pele groom him in- hold on. Shit, no, there's gotta be a better way of saying that, um... Plant Dirk there and let Pele train him into being a legendary player like Pele, and then snatch him away at the height of his fame, and then plans to do... nothing with Dirk. I'm seriously, he practically benches Dirk. He puts him in a shit team, doesn't allow him to manage the team, and sabotages and punishes the entire team regularly. I thought that maybe he does this so that Dirk could build up a team, and then he'd have two good teams, or at least have a team worthy of rivaling his own Iron Foot team so that they could practice against a worthy rival. This almost looks like it could be the case, but he cancels the whole tournament. Like, at the end of Act 3, the finals just cancelled so the elite team can practice. It's then you realise that this guy is somehow an even bigger idiot than Pele. One thing that I like about this game's story scenes is that you can select dialogue options, but they have no effect on anything. The story goes on no matter what, like you can select whatever option you want and it, it just carries on. So I always pick the least appropriate answer, and at this point in the game Pele was like, would you like to join my team again, and win, and be a superstar, and be super best friends forever? And my answer was just no. You're alright, Pele, I'm fine with it, I'll just stay here. Anyway, you basically get an invitation to join Team Pele again, and Pele's brilliant plan is to take the contract from the Unibrow's hands, and then he does something to the writing to make it say, from instead of to. I honestly cannot tell if he forges it here and now, or if there was, like, some smeary bits on it that he rubs off and it reveals the true word underneath. 
Either way, it's fucking stupid. So, he's either forged it or made it invalid. Good to know. So, I, I honestly can't tell which of these is the truth. He either knew that this was possible all along and said nothing whilst Dirk stayed with a known child abuser, or he deliberately allowed this to happen for the sake of this outcome. I legitimately don't know which of those is dumber or more dickish due to it being so close. It's like neck and neck. But either way, Pele's a fucking asshole and an idiot. The fourth act is pretty straightforward, as you play an entire tournament and win, and this guy is infuriated that his otherwise flawless plan is a bit flawed, so it all falls apart like his school does. Now the game does have more problems than the story, but it is very entertaining and stupid the story, and I can stomach that. I actually had a lot of fun and a few laughs going back over it to make sure that I knew as much as I could before sharing it because this story is just so moronic. I know that a few detractors will insist that the story in a football game doesn't matter and I'd normally be inclined to agree with that. But is it not fair to say that this story fails somewhat on a logical level? It's somewhat imperative in order for the story to work that everyone in said story has to be the biggest moron possible. Both the good guys and the bad guys are so stupid that I'm amazed that they can even dress themselves. We've gone beyond, oh it's just a football game with this level of stupid. I do appreciate the effort, don't get me wrong, I always appreciate a story mode in any game, especially now. Especially one that's a bit more inspired than the shitty story that FIFA 17 onwards threw at us. And it's a shame that Ubisoft wouldn't give a shit now and would just give us a garbage life service that goes on forever. Anyway, when it comes to a football game, it's clearly the gameplay that matters, so how does that hold up? In truth, I kinda like it. I mean, I'm talking as someone who doesn't really like football. Maybe if you want your football games to be more grounded, like FIFA, then you probably won't like it, but then again you have FIFA, so why would you need this to be the same? I just like how it has a lot of emphasis on being a game, and its visuals complement the over-the-top actions and style pretty well, and it's actually fun to play and watch. Like all Ubisoft games, it's reasonably sound mechanically. I'd say that the controls are fine, once you remember them, I did have a few problems where I kept pressing the wrong button by accident or something. I think my biggest problems with playing the game is the fact that you use the Wiimote, as that thing is just blech. I know that people really like the Wii and the Wiimote and everything to do with Nintendo, but I personally just hate the Wiimote. I hate the controls and I think it drags the system down a lot. It's got a shit battery life. It can be unresponsive, sometimes it fails altogether at the most annoying of times, and its attachments can also play up, forcing you to unplug them and plug them back in again mid-game. One of my nunchucks only allows me to run downwards, and the other one just malfunctions entirely at the worst possible moments. Like this literally happened in the final game of the story campaign. I'm aware that most games have these problems on the Wii, and it's not really the game's fault, it's the Wii's hardware. But it's not exactly innocent of flaws in spite of this. The AI can be thick as pig shit to the point that it feels like my team's special move is passing the ball to the other team. I know that it's a rather unorthodox idea, but keeping the ball out of the other team's possession is considered a good thing in football. I wouldn't mind so much, but this can happen in the penalty box and the area around the goal. And if that happens, you're basically fucked. As I said earlier, sometimes the game can take your button mashing as a suggestion rather than a command. And despite the fact that you've pressed the R2 shoot button thing on the remote 400 times, they are just like, nah, I guess he wants me to shoot, but it doesn't seem all that important. Most of these are minor annoyances, I admit, that only crop up once in a while. But the biggest flaw in this game is the third act. Like, the whole of the third act is where this game becomes bullshit, and it drags it down for me. Now, I know that there are narrative reasons for this being the case, but it's still fucking bullshit, and I hate it. In the third act, 
Dirk is the only character that I could control. He's put on a team that he isn't allowed to manage and therefore has no special abilities or items. And when the game is getting tougher, this does make it harder. I think I lost most of my matches in Act 3 because of this situation right here that this game has put me in and I actually almost gave up because of it when I had to beat three matches in a row and failure resulted in me in having to do the whole thing all over again. The biggest fuck you in this bit is that you end up in the team that you were in in Act 2, but they don't allow you to make any changes. You'd think that you would be allowed to swap some players around, but some new people that you're recruited in and the items that you get in Act 3 don't get to be used until Act 4. That's really annoying. In my case, I didn't have Dirk in the lineup and I needed him, as he was my best goal scorer. I changed my playstyle to a better one during the course of Act 3, as the thing that I did in Acts 1 and 2 didn't even work anymore, as I didn't utilise the special abilities of any of the characters. I kind of forgot I had them because I had a 3 month break between Act 1 and 2, and I completely forgot that I had that option. I will take the blame for some of this, but it seems so forced and stupid to make it so that you cannot upgrade any of the upgrading elements in the third act of your four act game, in which upgrading elements are crucial to getting good. Whenever I describe this, people often interrupt me and are like, do you mean that you don't get to upgrade in the first act? Because first act is what people hear because it sounds way more logical than the third act. I got so close to quitting because I thought the third act was impossible, but thankfully I was wrong and got to meet the Ubisoft guest stars. Yes indeedy. This game is like the Avengers of Ubisoft's most Ubiconic characters. We have Sam Fisher from Splinter Cell, Rayman from Sean White's Pro Snowboarding, Jade from Beyond Good and Evil, Altair from Assassin's Creed, The Prince from Prince of Persia who is referenced to as Thief for some reason, and I guess the Raving Rabbids count? The Rabbids are in this, yes, and are probably the most important of the crossover characters. Like seriously, they run the store that you buy the items from, and are often minor antagonists in the practice events. Sometimes unscrupulous teams hire them to represent them, and they have even had their own team at some point in the campaign so far. Honestly, a lot of people might expect me to be really angry about that, but I'm not. Because I consumed an entire month's worth of meds, so I'm pretty mellow right now. But also, they aren't really all that bad in this. They're more like the Minions from Despicable Me 1, rather than 2 and the Minions movie. They don't hog the spotlight with their unfunny antics, so they're a lot more tolerable. I prefer them to be a thing that doesn't exist, but if this is the worst that they were, I wouldn't hate them anywhere near as much. Not to mention that my frustration towards the Rabbids was them ruining Rayman, and they can only really do that once, so it can't really have the same effect again. I'm still not fucking letting them on my team though. I'd rather lose every game than break bread with a Rabbid. I will not stop until I wipe them off the face of the earth. So I actually got every single Ubiconic character onto the team, except for Sam Fisher, who I never figured out what he wanted. It was clearly a code word for an item, but I have no idea what it is and I really don't care. I didn't play much Splinter Cell as a kid, so yeah. Rayman is the funniest one though, by far. He says he is missing Glowbox and needs help finding him. So my instinct was to go to the item shop and look for Glowbox. I thought he might be an item or a toy or something. Turns out he's not in the game at all. No, the thing you need to do is pick up on when he says, I need two heads to find him. So obviously the solution is to buy a Rayman hat, which is literally Rayman's hollowed out head, and wear it in front of him. And because he's in Pele land, Rayman believes you're some sort of clone and follows you around for that reason. Honestly, when you go into Pele Land, I get the feeling that the second that the Hogwarts Express goes through the tunnel, which will be shaped like Pele's head with his mouth open, there will be the device, like, on the walls of the tunnel that will zap your brain and fry it. It's like that thing in Rick and Morty where they go on the plane 
and they scramble Rick's brains. They do this to all potentially dangerous passengers to neutralize them and allow them to fly on commercial airlines so they don't blow it up or something. Except it happens to everyone and doesn't ever stop happening ever in this universe. There are plenty of OCs who take over the main thing, but, well, they're pretty one note and forgettable. Only a few of them are recurring characters, which is to be expected. Most of the time they're on screen, they talk about the mechanics of the game and what to expect. I actually think they serve their purpose, they're okay. I don't hate any of them, but I don't like any of them either, so... They're pretty purgatory fodder. Another thing that I wanted to mention was, in this universe, there are no rules as to what you do on the pitch. So, one team actually puts landmines all over the pitch. Like, what's to stop me from fucking bombing it with a fucking AC-130 and killing everyone? Also, there's this one team full of girls, and the joke is that the boy team members all get turned on whenever they pass you by. Of course, they tell you this in Act 3, and there's no point in finding this out because you can't change your team lineup, so you just have to have a bunch of love-struck, young, lovey-dovey men who just have permanent stat penalties. But they come back in Act 4, and by this point I had all of the Ubisoft characters, and they were all lovey-dovey over this team of 12-year-old girls. So you've got Altair, the Prince of Persia, Sam Fisher, and Rayman, all like getting hard-ons for 12-year-old girls. Like the implication is there, it's clear as day. And like... Fuck, man. Rayman. I thought you were one of the good guys. I thought you were... You were my hero, Rayman. This must be how fans of fucking Gary Glitter felt. So to round it off nicely, this game is an interesting capsule of what Ubisoft was as a company 10 years ago. Not only that, but it also has some pretty funny instances in which they really want you to love Ubisoft. Like, they actually make it so that you can buy the Ubisoft banner which I bought because I felt so sorry for them. Yeah, I actually felt sorry for Ubisoft playing this fucking thing. They also have the Rabbids, who are described as being popular for some reason. Which is a complete lie. I don't remember them ever being popular. I just remember Ubisoft shoving them down our throats for about five years before giving up. Maybe that's just me though. Honestly, it's sad that the only one of these five franchises still around today due to Ubisoft's obsession with making everything into a fucking open world that has a live service element. I mean, I don't know, you'd think that from a business perspective you wouldn't make all of your games basically the same thing, but hell, they know what they're doing more than I do, I guess. They apparently can't make any more Splinter Cell, Rayman, or Prince of Persia games because you can't make them into an open world sandbox. Actually, I wouldn't mind a Rayman open world sandbox. That would be kind of cool. Maybe you can make it into an RPG like Croc 2, I think was an RPG, was it? Of some description? Make it like Croc 2, that was fun. Or make it an open world game. I'd love to see what Rayman's world would look like as an open world. I mean, you do realise that other kinds of games exist out there, right? Well, of course you do, you release them, just not Splinter Cell, or Rayman, or Prince of Persia anymore, because they can't be like every other fucking game. Honestly, I find this refreshing. It's quite different and enjoyable in its own way, and it was well put together, and despite it pissing me off several times, it's not too bad. I would actually recommend it to anyone who finds it interesting. Its weirdness is definitely worth the price of admission. I mean, w here we have a football game that is backed by an actual football player who retired in the 1970s that is also a massive crossover event between every massive character in a big publisher's lineup, and yet somehow it's been lost to time. This is unacceptable. The fact that I couldn't find any information on this no, god damn it, no. More people need to play this oddity and expose it for the bizarre bath salt hallucination that it is. Do it for Pele. I mean Pele. I'm sorry, I can't even say Pele as a joke, it just sounds so stupid. <laughs>
hell is filled with people like you. Ah!